everybody, welcome to STEM Clubs, our broadcast live from Dynamic Earth in Edinburgh as part of POP23, Protecting Our Planet Day. Now, my name is Chris. If you tuned in to the Protecting Our Ice and Ocean session earlier on, you might remember me from all those hours ago. And I'm joined here by Ali, Hello. who works at our planetarium. He is our astronomer, because today we are going to be talking a little bit about protecting our planet using satellites and how we can look at our world from space using satellites and do a bit of earth observation to make sure we're protecting all those different areas that you learned about today. So you might have joined um, some sessions like protecting our forest or protecting our um, ocean. Um, all of these different areas are all different areas we can look at using some space science um, and it helps us to make plans for how we're going to protect planet earth um, from the threat of climate change. Now, um, there are lots of different sessions that um, were broadcast earlier on. We're going to play a couple of bits and pieces um, if you did miss them, but uh, everything will be on YouTube um, in the near future. So keep an eye out for POP23 going up on YouTube and everything will be up there if there's anything you didn't catch that you would like to. Now for this session, there are lots of resources available on the STEM Clubs Hour um, page of the STEM Learning website. And there are lots of activities that you can do themed around climate change from lots of different providers. So the British Science Association, we've got the Royal Society, um, we've got some ESA, so the European Space Agency activities as well. And of course, there's a couple from Dynamic Earth too. And we're gonna be trying those out over the course of the session. So do prepare some bits and pieces over the course of the next hour because we appreciate that you have joined us after school. You clearly are true enthusiastic scientists like myself and Ali if you joined after school and um, with STEM clubs hour. Um, now we, um, as, as I said, we're going to talk about how satellites can be used to protect planet Earth. And before we get stuck into that, I think it probably makes sense for us to actually establish and define what a satellite is and how they get up into space in the first place before we talk about all the different ways that we use them. So for that, I will turn to our resident astronomer, Ali. What are satellites and how do we get them into space? Uh, well, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll start with the basics. These are the things that we put in space up above the Earth, and there are loads of them up above your head right now. Technically, the word satellite, you could use that to describe a natural satellite in astronomy. Things like the moon technically mm -hmm. count as a satellite, but these days, satellites tend to mean the bits we've built and thrown up into space. Uh, now, we do have a clip that we, we can show, because the key thing with a satellite is it's really difficult to get into space, and I'll try and show you just how difficult so in this next clip, what you're going to see is kind of a, a simulated launch right here from Edinburgh, as it happens. Uh, and in that clip, what we're going to do is we're going to get going fast. That is all you have to do with these satellites. And as the clip is playing, I'll be able to talk over the clip and try and talk through what we're actually seeing out the window. So it's not a real launch. I think we'd get in trouble for <laughs> launching yeah, actual no. rockets. We are not trained astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, we'll um, set off that clip now so we can see what it would look like if we launched a uh, satellite from dynamic Earth. Yeah, so here's us leaving Edinburgh right now. So views are lovely. It's not often you see Edinburgh this cloud free. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to climb really fast all the way up to an altitude of around about 10 kilometers. Now we started off facing towards the south there and now twisting towards the west. Real satellites, you don't really need to point in a particular direction except the one you need to fly in. I just wanted the view to be better here as we're climbing. Now, once we get to around about 10 kilometers, it's going to pause just for a little bit because it's worth remembering that as human beings, we've made getting to this altitude routine, like really easy. Hop on a passenger jet and you can get views like this out of the window, maybe not quite as cloud free as <laughs> this one. Now, uh, planes are only good up to a certain altitude. The air starts to get too thin and even things like helium balloons, they can get you a lot higher, but they're still going to um, fail at around about 30, maybe 40 kilometers in altitude and we're not even halfway to space at that height. So the only real option to get into space is to ride on a rocket. So that means the rocket engine is firing behind you. We're now accelerating every single second that rocket motor is firing. You're getting pressed back into your seat. And right now we're around about 70 kilometers up. Now we're just going to speed up the next little bit because you've got to get going so fast. You have to accelerate on that rocket for eight whole minutes. Getting to the edge of space, which is about 100 kilometers up, that's the easy part. But staying in space means you've got to go incredibly fast. So fast, we're going to be going faster than bullets from guns. Seven and a half kilometers per second. So that takes us eight whole minutes. Now, once we actually get up into orbit, you're going to start seeing the 
stars. We've finally cleared the densest bit of Earth's atmosphere. The stars start to come out. And space technically starts anything above 100 kilometers. And you can see we've actually got the aurora because I've pointed our rocket towards the North Pole here. Now, once we arrive in orbit, things will slow down a little bit. I'm just trying to remember that speed, seven and a half kilometers per second. You could get Edinburgh to London in way less than two minutes at that speed. You're not switching gravity off, you're just cheating gravity. The planet's always trying to pull you straight down towards it. But because we're now traveling so fast in the direction that we're facing, the poor Earth can only just hold on to you. So you end up getting pulled in a circle all the way around the planet. And that circle is what we tend to call an orbit. But all we're doing here is just falling with style. Yes, so you're it. basically trying to make sure you're not actually just falling straight back Back down again onto the surface. Yes, just, that would uh, make a bit of a mess, so yes. not a good idea. So we can cut to the next clip now because the next thing to talk about is how far away you want to get from the Earth because there's loads of different good places for parking satellites. Yes. And I'm going to try and show you this in a, a slightly silly way, but it should be easier to see <laughs> on smaller screens in particular. So there's our lovely Earth, the blue marble itself. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring in a giant soap bubble and wrap it around our planet. Now, the first time the bubble appears, that's going to be set to the edge of space, about 100 kilometers up. It's not an exact line, but give or take, most people agree that's where space begins. You can see just how thin our planet's atmosphere really is. There's really not much to it. Now, when the bubble increases here, you're going to see all of the bit of space we tend to call low Earth orbit. That's orbits anything up to around about 2,000 kilometers. And just for uh, something to bear in mind, no human being has been outside of this bubble since the Apollo program. It's only the Apollo astronauts that left the low Earth orbit bubble. Because that was that 50, 50, 50 years, years ago? ago now. It's yeah. slightly depressing, but we might be going back. <laughs> now, this next distance, this is what we call a medium Earth orbit. Out here, you're not going nearly as fast. You're going once around the planet uh, or twice around the planet per day and this is the perfect place to park things like the global positioning satellites so you don't want to sit really close to the earth you sit a bit further back so you can see more of the surface and the global positioning satellites is gps right gps That's your Google Maps. exactly That's yes how we get where we're going now this last bubble is a really special bubble because if you're orbiting in a circle at that distance you go around the earth exactly once every 24 hours there's a really special place on that bubble and that is a single line all the way around the earth's equator way up out in space and we call that geostationary orbit. Now, I'm actually going to turn on the real satellites here. If your screen is too dark, crank up the brightness, see if you can spot them all. But that line is really special. If you're sitting on geostationary orbit, you are going around the planet at the same speed the planet rotates. So in effect, you're always staring at exactly the same part of planet Earth. Whatever you're hovering above, you'll appear to not move in the sky if we're sat underneath you. So it's a really useful place to put Earth observation missions. Now, you can see here it's getting very crowded, crowded right? Mm. There's a lot of satellites in space. Last I checked, there are 9,000 active satellites. That number has more than doubled in the last four years alone. So it's a little bit scary. That's going to go up even more in the next few years. And just to give you an idea of where they're all traveling, these are the orbits. Now, orbits tend to be circular, but you don't have to be in a circle. You could be egg-shaped uh, at the narrow point of your orbit. You're traveling a bit faster when you get close to the Earth, and then you slow down as you're going further away and coming back again. Now, as we zoom out, there's one really important thing to include here, and that is the original satellite, and that's the moon. I'm just going to draw in the moon for scale, so you can see there's some big egg-shaped orbits there. That might even be something that was visiting the moon, sticking out on the right-hand side there. So yeah, it's getting pretty busy. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, why are there so many more satellites now? Is it more commercial stuff? More people are able to send stuff up? Yeah, Starlink is one of those companies, communication. Mm -hmm. They want to have loads of satellites, but they also don't want any delay. So they're closer to the Earth, so the signals travel up and down faster. Right, so you yeah. need more satellites to cover the whole Earth. Mm. Um, low Earth orbit is also amazing if you want the highest resolution, the most zoomed in pictures you can possibly make. Oh, okay. And some of our best Earth observation missions need to get right up close because you want all the detail you can. Geostationary orbit's just a little bit further away. <laughs> now, the last thing I've added in here, just as this clip is coming to an end, those yellow dots, they are the leftovers. There's about four <laughs> times more bits of old spacecraft, anything bigger than about 10 centimeters, all drifting around up there. And remember, they're all traveling faster than bullets as well. And if you want to count the really small things, millions of centimeter sized and maybe even 100 million tiny particles out there that we can't track them all. So we have to keep mm -hmm. track of all the satellites yeah. that we've sent up there, but then we also have to keep track of all the little bits
bits of debris and other bits and pieces that have also ended up there and not actually been got rid of properly in the past. Is that yes, right? in a perfect world, you park your satellites or you deorbit them, you bring them back into the Earth's atmosphere, but there's a lot of leftovers that are going to be hanging around mm. up there for a while, so we want to avoid them all if we can. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, that's pretty amazing that we've now have got the technology to blast satellites up into space. We've worked yep. out the best way to get them up. A lot of them going north. You might have seen us going over Orkney and Shetland in the very yeah. north of Scotland as the satellite was launching. Uh, catch some northern lights if you're lucky. Um, and then try your best not to fall back down to Earth. Yes. Unless we, satellite comes through the end of its life. This is true. We've gotten so good at doing this now that you don't just launch one at a time. You can launch 50 in one go if you really want oh, to. Well, so yeah. Part Easy. of the reason why it's getting crowded. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, sending 50 satellites into space at once. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was lots of information. I think we yeah. all know roughly what satellites are now. And we're going to focus a little bit more in a moment about how we can use them to protect planet Earth. So I thought it might be nice to start off by looking back at a clip from earlier in the day from the Protecting Our Earth session, which is a little snippet from um, Planet Earth 3. And it's also going to be followed by a couple of clips of a couple of people who work in different scientific areas. So we've got Amber, who's a countryside ranger, and we've got Joel, who is a satellite scientist. So we're going to have a little look at those clips now. Good morning. Mother Nature painted the sky for us this dawning. She took some crimson reds and rubbed them into oranges. Trees they stretch their arms and they dance they rehearse them. The ocean rolls down the line, standing proud. Mother Nature, we're just showing off now. Once again, we journey across our magnificent planet. To meet the astonishing animals that live here. And reveal their extraordinary stories. Hi, I'm Amber and I work at the North York Moors National Park. I'm an apprentice ranger. I help people access and enjoy one of the UK's 15 national parks. No day is the same, but it sort of follows a pattern. There is a lot of problem solving and logical thinking involved in the job to meet our high standards. We usually do one or two jobs a day, making the rights of way usable for the public, like maintaining trails, boundaries and park furniture, or doing drainage work. We also help control certain invasive species. We always have to consider the different landscapes and terrains, along with the National Park's wildlife. There are bigger jobs too. Some surfacing jobs require big dumper trucks to lay stone, and flagging can take weeks to finish. I worked in a team that fitted a whole new bridge, which was really rewarding. Since school, I knew I wanted to do something for the environment. I love that I live where I work and I'm doing a job that allows people to enjoy and access the countryside. I get some amazing views when I'm working. If you follow your interests, you'll find you're more passionate about what you do. Hi, my name's Joel, precision machinist at Railspace. I've loved engineering since I was young. I was home educated, which meant I could finish my studies for the day and then make things. I once even built a ride-on battery-powered train. 
I like being hands-on, so after my GCSEs I did a practical apprenticeship with Rolls-Royce building jet engines, then moved to a defence research and development company. I'm now a full-time technician at the Rouse Base Precision Development Facility. I produce parts for little radio receivers that we make for satellites. Some of the parts we make are assembled using a hair on the end of a pair of tweezers. That's how small we're talking. Some of the machinery we use is one of a kind in the UK. Lots of our satellite parts go into UK and European space agency projects, and parts made in the facility have gone into orbit and even beyond. I'm excited about the progression opportunities. I enjoy sharing my knowledge with other people as well, in the same way as I've been able to learn from others. Okay, so we had a couple of clips there. We had a bit from Planet Earth 3. You might have been watching that at home already. Um, and you can actually see a session where they spoke to some of the producers from Planet Earth 3 as part of the Protecting Our Earth session. So keep an eye out for that on YouTube and see uh, more about Planet Earth and see some more cool footage. And we had Amber and Joel there and I wanted to throw in a couple of science jobs that you could maybe pursue. One where you're getting out into nature and getting hands on with protecting the countryside and the nature potentially on your doorstep, maybe a little bit further. Um, and we had Joel as well, who's building parts that are going up into space for satellites, which are then looking back down on that nature. So it all ties together. Now, we have a new satellite behind us, which you may have noticed. So behind us, this is Aeolus. Now, this is a satellite um, which is used to measure weather and weather patterns and um, build pictures of what climate patterns and climate change looks like around the world. Now, I say is, sadly, Aeolus is no longer with us. Um, it was decommissioned slash was burned up in the atmosphere at the end of its life um, earlier this year in the spring. But I thought we would um, get started with one of our our crafts. So you might have um, already printed them out, you might have gotten uh, started on making them, cutting stuff out. We have got uh, one we made earlier, which I'll ask Ali to demonstrate. Um, and Ariolus looks a little bit like this one. So you can see as Ali demonstrates it, how it compares to the real thing behind us. Um, a couple of different parts of it. We've got this round bit at the top, which is a sun sensor, which makes sure essentially that it's always um, facing the right way. Um, and it's got a couple of solar panels at the side. And so it's always got the energy, the electricity it needs to function. And right in the middle, this is the body or potentially the bus of the satellite, you might call it. Now, if you want to get stuck into building it, or if you already have, great, um, fire on in. If you want some pointers, what I would say is, Ali, do you have the main bit of the satellite here? Yeah, this bit is the main body of your satellite. So start with that, and all you're doing is you're trying to make that into a cube. And that is going to be the main bit of your Aeolus. And once you've got that, it's just a case of making your sun sensor, uh, which wraps around and sticks on top, and then popping your solar panels on. Now, we've used some uh, straws for that. Um, we've used some paper straws, but you can also use card or paper, just something that means they'll stick out at the sides. Now, do you know anything about any of the instruments that we've got on Aeolus, Ali? Aeolus, it's, it's kind of cool because it's a, one of the coolest things I think it does is it sees the wind without seeing the wind because mm -hmm. you can follow the clouds really easily in satellite pictures and you can measure wind speed using that but when there's no clouds how do you measure the wind and this is using uh, ultraviolet light so pulses of that light go down and actually they, they bounce off very tiny particles in that wind so things like dust and stuff and it's enough that this is able to catch what comes back so it's almost like illuminating the wind with a teeny tiny flashlight and you're just catching a tiny bit back but it's really cool yeah it's really clever mm -hmm. because so i've got here something called an anemometer so this is something that you might be able to um buy at your stem clubs they're about about 15 pounds so they're not too expensive and uh, they look like this and at the top you'll be able to see that there is what looks like a little fan so it's uh, something that you get at weather stations things like that because these can measure the wind actually on planet earth and mm. um, now there's no air in outer space so we wouldn't fit one of these onto Aeolus so it needs a different way of measuring that wind speed um, and as Ali says it's got very clever ways of detecting mm. that change detecting that movement up across the surface now if you want to try one of these um, what you can do is, well, if I go through it, then oh, I did a little gust of air that got up to about eight miles per hour. Right. Ali, do you want to have a go? Yes. 
<laughs> I think I put more effort in that, up to 12 miles per hour. So you can, if you want to, you can have a go at um, making some little gusts of wind of your own. Um, you can also take them outside. So if you do want to do any activities outside, you can start measuring how fast the wind blows, and then you can compare it to things like the Beaufort scale, which is something that meteorologists, weather forecasters will use um, to predict damage that can be done to different areas. So you've got gusts, which are very short and um, sharp bits of wind, and then you've got um, a longer, more continuous wind as well. Um, so you can use an anemometer um, to measure it on land. Aeolus can measure it out in space as well. And Ali, am I right in thinking that we have some footage of how some weather, how some cloud cover or nasty weather might be forming? Uh, yeah, this next footage we've got for you, it's a, it's a really nice clip, so we can just start it running. It's from uh, one of the geostationary satellites, and its job is to pay attention to North and South America. So it's run by the United States. This one, the GOES spacecraft, there's a couple of them at least, uh, and this is one of the later generations. But it's special up here so this is just a beautiful time lapse of just everything that's happening that this satellite can see so you can see clouds during the daytime and at night time because it's got instruments that allow it to see the clouds in the dark it's using infrared light as well it can see dust from forest fires and it can zoom in on some of these areas to really track how those forest fires are progressing you can see lightning flashes as well and if you can make out just uh, the Gulf of Mexico sort of uh, uh, three quarters of the way up the way just in the middle there's a hurricane forming right there so mm. uh, a alerting people on the ground when the weather's starting to look a little bit bad is also incredibly important as well. So that's, I just think these are so pretty. It's beautiful. I, I did notice there's some little like glitchy bits and that's not just because the video's gone a bit wrong. That's something to do with the satellite picking up the data, right? Yeah, so if something's gone wrong in the transmission or maybe you've had a, a solar burp and a little bit of extra solar uh, particles floating around near the spacecraft and that can sometimes interfere with transmissions and mess up mm. the CCD. And you can even see hints of the sun passing too close to the detector in the background ah. there. So yeah, you've got to get rid of that. Amazing. So with satellites, um, similar to Aeolus, we mm -hmm. can actually paint pictures of what the weather is like and start to get a better idea of how it might change in areas across the world. And as we saw there, you can actually start to see some hurricanes forming. And so we can then take action as well to protect people who might be vulnerable. And things like this might be more common as the climate is changing, seeing more extreme weather events around the world. So using the satellite data is really invaluable in protecting people and making sure we can put plans into action. Wonderful. So I hope you've managed to uh, make some headway in making your Aeolus. I'm not expecting you to have finished that yet um, unless you got a head start right at the beginning of the session. Um, but now you've got a little bit more of an idea of what Aeolus does um, and why it's a really useful satellite to have. Now I'll also introduce our second satellite of the day. So we'll change our background so that we can see Sentinel-6. Now, I mentioned that Aeolus is not in space anymore. It uh, came to the end of its life earlier this year. Um, but Sentinel, that's currently orbiting Earth right now. And it's a completely different shape. It looks a little bit like a little house. Um, and Ali has got a lovely version here um, to see what the completed papercraft looks like. Now, a yeah. couple of things to point out is, Ali, would you be able to pass me the body oh. of the of the Sentinel craft, Nobody yes. Saw. So this big bit, as you probably know, um, is the main part of Sentinel. And you fold up the sides like this, um, and then you fold up these sides like this. So it's like a house without a roof, essentially, is how I describe it. That is gonna be the main um, bus of your Sentinel-6 satellite. Now, there's a couple of other bits that we attach to it, which might be a little bit trickier to work out. Um, one of them we can see just at the top here, um, that folds into a little cube and then we have a dish on the top. So um, that goes up and down. I think I might just be blocking it. I think it's, whoa. so this, oh, not the other shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> this shoulder, this Stay shoulder. Right. There's a dish over around about there. Nice. Um, and so it goes up and down. And we've also got a little um, antenna down at the bottom here. Now that's a little bit easier to see, so I won't be blocking it as much. Whoop, there we go. Um, so in our models, it's one bit of paper, but you can see in real life, they are little thin bits um, that connect together at the end. Now, Ali, am I right in thinking these are both different types of antenna, sending and receiving data? Yeah, this one's not using ultraviolet light. I think it's mostly microwaves. It's a type of radar 
are. And it's doing the same kind of thing. It's bouncing signals down and looking for what's coming back. Um, but its mission is very different to what Aeolus was designed to yeah. do. So yeah, really cool. Yeah, so Sentinel is actually looking um, predominantly at the ocean's mm -hmm. surface. So it's measuring how high the ocean is and it's measuring waves as well, how high the waves are getting to help us understand how sea levels might be rising around the world. Now, you can get started making your Sentinels, um, and as you do, we have got a clip for you, which is a clip specially recorded for STEM Club's Hour. I spoke to a polar scientist called Roseanne, and we spoke to her earlier on in our Protecting Our Ice and Ocean session as well, but she um, did a conversation with me a couple of days ago um, where we discussed how we can use satellite data to do some polar research. So we'll start playing that, and you can build your satellites. Okay, welcome everybody to my chat with Roseanne Smith, who is a polar scientist who is down in Antarctica, who uh, you may have seen earlier on if you joined our Protecting Our Ice and Ocean session, but she's agreed to chat to us a little bit for our STEM Clubs Hour session as well. So, Roseanne, for anyone who maybe didn't see the Protecting Our Ice and Ocean session, can you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you are, why are you there? Of course. So I'm a polar scientist and I have actually travelled all the way down to Antarctica, which is where I am now, and I'm standing on board a ship. The ship is called the RRS Sir David Attenborough, or sometimes we call it the SDA short. And I'm standing on board the SDA on the ocean that surrounds Antarctica. And I think if I hold my hand like that, you might be able to see some of the land in the distance. Oh yeah, yeah, we can. So yeah, it's a bit um, cold here today. There's lots of wind <laughs> blowing. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. It's a very wild wilderness down here in Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, we had a little moment where your face froze, but then you came back a few seconds later. <laughs> so we do still have you connected. Fantastic. So you're down in Antarctica, you're studying all these different areas. So um, how do you actually decide where you're going to travel in Antarctica and what you're going to study? That's a good question. So one of the ways that the ship um, actually decides where to go is, first of all, we decide what we want to study. And one of the main things we're interested in on this scientific cruise is looking at the sea ice that surrounds the Antarctic continent. Now, sea ice is basically frozen ocean. The temperature gets so low in winter that the surface of the ocean freezes over, and that's what we call sea ice. So we're really keen to get up close to the sea ice and actually try to sail into the sea ice and take some measurements of the ocean conditions beneath the surface of that sea ice. We'll be looking at things like the temperature of the seawater and the saltiness of the seawater. And we're also really interested to see what kind of life and nutrients are bubbling away beneath the surface of the sea ice as well. Amazing. So there's so many things you, you can measure um, if you know where the sea ice is, but how do you actually know where there's going to be lots of sea ice? Because surely it's going to vary a little bit every year. Yeah, that's a really good point. It does vary a lot every year. And one of the ways that we know where the sea ice actually is, is we use satellite data. So satellites, as we know, are always up there in space, gathering lots of measurements about the conditions at Earth's surface. And that includes looking at the amount of sea ice that is present around the world. And so using satellite data, we can track where the thickest bits of the sea ice are, and we can basically make a beeline for those areas of the ocean. Oh, amazing. So you know where you want to go to try and actually yeah. get the measurements you need um, to study the sea ice. Are there any areas that you want to avoid as well when you're sailing around? There are lots of areas. So the currently on the Antarctic here, which is quite a complicated bit of land, lots of islands to avoid, lots of shallow parts of the ocean to avoid as well. But one of the main other hazards are icebergs. There are lots of icebergs in this part of Antarctica. Some of them are big, some of them are small. They come in all different shapes, sizes, and even colours. And icebergs are actually fascinating. We want to get close to them sometimes to get some measurements near them, but we definitely didn't want to get too close. And so that's where satellites come in again, because they can basically track the movement of these icebergs from space, tell us where they are, and we can make sure that we can 
anticipate them and not get too close. That's amazing. Yes, so you can actually predict and plan your route based on what satellites are telling you. And then Absolutely. when you're actually out there, um, I guess it must mean that you're then actually almost able to double check all the information you're getting from the satellites, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. So satellites are fantastic. They can tell us a huge amount about the conditions on the surface ocean and the amount of ice that's there. Um, but we need to know that the numbers that they're telling us and the measurements that they're telling us about are exactly truthful and correct. And the only way to know if they are truthful and correct is to go there in person on a ship like this put some sensors into the surface ocean and get some readings ourselves in person. And that's really, really important as an extra check to see if the satellite data is matching with reality. And so this is something that's done on a regular basis as much as possible. And this serves as a really good way to improve the reliability of the satellite measurements. Yeah, cool. And so you are down there in, well, we're in November now. Like, would you be able to go down at any time of year to do this or? Ah, well, yeah. there are certain times of year that we probably would want to avoid. You see, in the Southern Hemisphere in winter, which actually is a little bit different to winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Winter here is in June, July and August, our mm -hmm. summer time. And in those months in Antarctica, the light levels drop away. It hardly gets light at all, very, very dark, and it's also very, very cold. It becomes really difficult to come down to Antarctica to gather data. And so satellites can be really useful for these times of year because they can carry on collecting measurements from space, even when it's too dangerous and too dark and cold for scientists to come here in person. I should say, there are some scientists that do stay here throughout winter, but there's not many of them. <laughs> well, I won't um, make you stand outside on deck any longer. You can um, go inside <laughs> and warm up. But thank you so much for coming along and chatting to us a little bit about the work that you're doing and how it ties into um, the satellite stuff that we're looking at as well. And um, it's been really great to hear from you. Um, and we'll head back on over to STEM Clubs Hour back at Dynamic Earth. So thank you very much, Roseanne. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. So I hope you enjoyed getting an insight into some of the work that Roseanne is doing and how satellites can help us explore some of these really remote, difficult to explore areas. Because as Roseanne says, at some times of year, they might want to avoid going to the South Pole. Very, very difficult to explore because it's so cold, such a difficult environment to be in. Um, so I hope you're progressing well with your satellites, your Aeoluses and your Sentinel-6s. We're not going to introduce another satellite just yet, so you've still got some time to work on them. I'll just give a little shout out to anyone who wants to attend the Twilight for Teachers session that will have kicked off just a minute or two ago. That's with the Natural History Museum. So if you want to join that session, that's kicking off just now. If you are staying with us, though, um, thank you. Lovely to have you. Um, and we are going to be talking a little bit more about the ocean and some of the research that we can do um, on the ocean using satellites. So I mentioned that Sentinel-6 looks at the surface of the ocean and sea levels um, rising um, and the height of different waves as well. You can also take some atmospheric measurements as well, so above the sea, but satellites can also be used to explore the deep sea as well. So Ali, I believe you have a little clip to show us which shows off how we can measure the deep sea. Hopefully. Yeah, what you're going to see here is a little bit hard to wrap your brains around, but this is what planet Earth looks like if all you draw is the position of robotic floats that are in our oceans. So there are so many of these things, they get called Argo floats, and they're designed to sink all the way down a couple of kilometres in the ocean and take measurements. When they come back to the surface, they call home. And some of the ocean science that we can do today is only possible because of the data that comes from these floats and just look at how pretty that is if you look really close you can even see the continents there because there's yeah. almost no corner of our ocean that doesn't have a float relatively nearby amazing so, yeah so it's yeah. really cool all those little twinkly bits are just a little well i say a little float a float in the sea that can go up and down different levels and take different measurements mm. now we happen to have one of those floats so we may have to duck down slightly see so if we can do this stay on camera Whoa. here we go so if we pull it up like this so put it next to 
So yeah, Ali can uh, <laughs> lift it up if he wants to. It is quite heavy. Um, so it's called a float, but it's surprisingly heavy. Um, and this is actually, well, it's gone off screen. You can get an idea of how tall it is. I'm about six foot and it's taller than I am. Now this one um, washed up on a beach. So as Ali says, it's essentially a sort of robotic um, piece of equipment that will float up and down in the ocean. It's not attached to anything, um, but it'll take all these measurements. They'll ping up to satellites and those little pings are what you saw in that clip before. Now this one washed up on a beach, as I say, and we got it donated to us by the uh, Scottish Association of Marine Science. So Sam's gave this to us, um, and it's a pretty amazing way to actually picture what is sending all that information up to satellites and telling us about the deep, deep sea. So even sat though satellites are up in space, we can use them to explore the depths of the ocean. One of those dots in that last video might have one been this. That's yeah, really could cool. have been that very <laughs> one, absolutely. So, um, so that is how we can um, use satellites to learn a little bit more about mm. the sea. Now, for the next activity, I wanted to explore the depths of the ocean a little bit more. So. This is where you might need a syringe and a marshmallow. So, Ali, do you need a hand in popping this yeah, let's down talk again? Yeah, Okay, so let's do our very um, subtle little <laughs> dip down to the ground. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, if you get a syringe and a mini marshmallow, if you have one, and um, if not, then um, pay close attention and you'll know how to do this again in future. Um, so, I have got a mar uh, syringe for Ali. You can model it for me. And, I've got some little marshmallows in a tub, and you've all you need to do. Too. Oh, okay. I've got yeah, quite a lot of spares. <laughs> you can use more than one if you want. There you go, Ali. You can have a white one. I will uh, take a pink one. Um, now, for this, what you can do if you want to is you can draw a little face on your marshmallow. Now, I didn't bring a pen, so sorry, Ali. You can't draw a face on it this time. <laughs> But the reason you might want to draw a face on it is because this is going to be a deep sea fish. So the Argo floats go down to the deep sea, but there's something that we made. There's something that scientists designed and made to be very robust so it could survive in the very deep, dark depths of the ocean. Now, this is a fish. So if you take your uh, syringe and then you plop the uh, plunger out, um, a very fun noise, and then you pop the marshmallow into the syringe, and then you can put the plunger back in. Now, what you need to do is push the plunger down so you can see the black end of the plunger on my one here. So it's just um, above the marshmallow, but not squashing it. And then you're going to cover the end up with a finger or a thumb. And this can be a tricky bit. So you might want to take turns, get someone to cover the end for you if you're struggling to do it on your own. This is where we're going to change the pressure inside the syringe. So we're using air pressure for this experiment. Um, so if you pull the, print, the syringe plunger up while your finger is still over the end, you will start to see a change in your deep sea marshmallow fish. It's starting to get bigger and bigger. And that's because there's less pressure squishing it. We can try it the other way around as well. If you um, take your finger off the end and then you put your plunger up like that, then you cover the end again, you can then squish it and you should see that the air is actually squashing your marshmallow because you're increasing the pressure. Cool. Now in the ocean, obviously it's water rather than air, but those deep sea fish have a huge amount of water squishing them all the time. So imagine that pressure is squishing your deep sea marshmallow fish. So squishing it and squishing it and squishing it until it's as small as you can make it. These creatures have to survive those extremes. And Argo floats, other equipment that we send down, so like uh, ROVs, remote autonomous vehicles, and AUVs, so autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, there are different kinds of robot we can send into the sea that can explore these areas, but they have to be incredibly tough to survive a few kilometers of water squashing them in some areas. So that's a way that you can see the effects of pressure, squishing um, things and making them expand as well. A famous example of a deep sea creature being expanded um, when it comes up to the surface because there's no pressure, it, well, less pressure, is the blobfish. Have you seen the blobfish, Ali? I have. It's it looks the one like with it's a comedy nose. nose right? It looks like it's big got a big nose. comedy nose. It wouldn't normally like look like that in the deep sea. <laughs> so that is our pressure experiment using the marshmallows. So you can have a go at that in your own classrooms. And 
Next up, we've got a couple more clips for you. So um, we have got um, a clip all about how we might want to protect our forests um, across the world. And we've got another clip of a scientist who um, works on wind turbines. So he works um, on making sure that we've got wind turbines that can give us renewable, sustainable energy. So we'll play those clips for you now while you build your satellites. Starting at sea level and on the equator, we're going to take you on a tour of the world's forests. Mangroves are found at sea level in the tropics and subtropics, extending to temperate regions in the United States and Australia. Humid, wet tropical forests are found on either side of the equator, mainly in Central America, South America and Southeast Asia, but also extend to the subtropical zones. Where conditions are drier and often more seasonal, savanna woodlands are found with these occupying large areas of Africa, South America and Australia. Mediterranean type forests also occur in drier areas of Europe and in North America and Australia and are mostly evergreen. Temperate forests are found in the mid-latitude, including here in the United Kingdom. They are either broadleaf, shedding their leaves in the autumn and regaining them in the spring, or needle-leaved, most of which keep their leaves throughout the year. The boreal forests cover vast swathes of land in the regions towards the poles and consist mainly of conifers, but also of birch and willow. Where it is too cold, the forests give way to the tundra, bare rock, snow and then ice. Forests are teeming with life, measured in terms of their biodiversity. As a general rule, diversity is lowest in the boreal zones and greatest in the tropics. We are perhaps most familiar with large mammals and birds at home, but also those living today in the vast savanna woodlands. But other life forms also rule these places. Invertebrates, ants, butterflies, moths, worms, but also bacteria and fungi. Mangroves are really efficient at pulling carbon from the atmosphere. They do this by pulling the carbon down into the biomass, into the leaves, uh, the sticks, the trunks, and down into the roots and the pneumatophores as well. When they do this, they're actually pulling carbon from the atmosphere that would normally stay there and contribute to climate change. Because the mangrove and salt marsh areas are both wet quite frequently because of tides coming in and out, and because it's saline environments, Often when they pull that carbon into the biomass and then down into the root zone, that carbon stays in the root zone for a very long time. And this is what we call carbon sequestration. Forests are the lungs of the earth. Whilst we take in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide, the trees take in carbon dioxide and send out oxygen. An essential vital cycle for life on earth. But this cycle has been broken. Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm a 66 kV senior authorised person and electrical maintenance technician for the EDS HV group, which are part of James Fisher Renewables. When I left school, I went into an engineering apprenticeship with SSEN for work inside substations. I worked there for over eight years before moving into the wind industry with Vattenfall. After working as a service technician for a while, an opportunity presented itself, which was too good to turn down. This was working with EDS HV Group. My daily tasks vary quite a lot. One day I could be transferring from the quayside to the crew transfer vessel and then on to the turbine, or I could be at the substation on shore to carry out some maintenance tasks. The job is really interesting and it feels good to be part of something that is making a difference for us all and for the future. Welcome back everybody to Dynamic Earth as part of STEM Club's Hour. So we had a little clip there about the importance of forests for the health of planet Earth and a few different types of forests that we get around the world, particularly mangroves. Now mangroves are these really, really cool environments because they survive in this kind of brackish water, this sort of boundary between salty and fresh water. And um, as our scientists were explaining, they take in a lot of carbon dioxide. They're really good at pulling that carbon dioxide, that greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere and storing it so that the greenhouse gases aren't going up into the atmosphere and contributing to climate. 
climate change. Um, so forests are an incredibly important ecosystem in our environment. We had a Protecting Our Forest session earlier on, so keep an eye out for that going up on YouTube later on if you want to learn more about it. Um, and um, we also had Aaron, who, as I say, we, was a wind turbine technician, and he got to work out in the ocean. We've got uh, wind turbines out in the ocean as well as on land. Again, making sure that we're coming up with ways that we're not putting carbon and dioxide up into the atmosphere, because we don't want to put too much up in there for the forest to have to absorb. So. Um, we actually have another little clip that we can show you um, in just a moment, which is showing us how the forest cover can change across planet Earth, don't we, Ali? Yeah, I had a lot of fun putting this one together. So <laughs> Glad to hear it. There's a lot going on in the clip, so I'll, I'll do my best to talk everything through as we're seeing it. So uh, what you're going to see is actually something called the, the Blue Marble data set. Uh, so there's the, you're actually looking at the South Pole right now, so shout out to Roseanne who's sitting out, uh, uh, where did you say she was? She's, uh, she was in Rothero when we spoke to her, so that little pointy bit you can see at the side, <laughs> she was along there. So we're not seeing any sea ice here, so for uh, to Roseanne I can only apologise, but what you're getting in this data is really special. It's an average picture of the Earth 12 different times, so one per month over the whole year and NASA scientists worked really, really hard using every bit of satellite data they could to see the Earth. So every piece of satellite imagery, the clouds were removed or the pictures with no clouds were stitched together. And what you're seeing is literally the Earth breathing. This is the same 12 pictures, so one year of the Earth that I've just set looping and looping and looping. And you can see the green coming and going, especially at the, the southern tip of Africa there. You can see the seasons coming and going. Uh, and we're just slowly rotating the planet now. So apologies if anyone's feeling a little bit seasick right now. Say, though, they looks like the world actually is breathing though. To say that the forests are the lungs of the earth, that makes it look like they literally are. Yeah, so one year per second, give or take here. Yeah. So you're just, you're going through it so fast. And then look at the change that you see in the Northern Hemisphere as well. Compared to the Southern Hemisphere, mm. look at how much that snow and ice cover is changing. Now, obviously we're missing the sea ice, so I'd love to see another blue marble where we could add the sea ice in, in as well. Uh, but it's a really nice way of seeing just how much is changing. And this is just year to year, you know, it's like if you're doing years or weeks or days, that's mm. the weather. But if you want to talk about the climate, you're really talking decade to decade to decade. So you need to do this again and again and again and look for those long term changes, the things that aren't trending in the right direction. We need mm. to go whoop and make sure we can get them on the right track. And it's yeah. data like this is really nice for just seeing how it's, that works. This is a really good indication as well of how some air currents are affecting the ice cover as well, right? Because yes. if uh, anyone out there has heard of the Gulf Stream, surely that's why we're not getting covered in as much ice. Yeah, as we, we, we are in here. The UK is about halfway <laughs> up. That's the Northern Hemisphere. Now, North Pole's right in the middle. And you can see compared to Norway, Scandinavia, the rest of Russia, they get a lot of snow and ice and we hardly get any. And it's because we've got this nice, not warm, but there's a, a warmer <laughs> current of water that's helping keep our local climate just that bit milder throughout the year warm. and wetter. <laughs> cool. So we can come back to us there because now the ice and the forest cover has stopped moving. So um, we can say our goodbyes to that clip. So goodbye to the blue marble. Goodbye, um, um, uh, but I thought that was a really nice way of seeing that the Earth is sort of alive. And by getting that imagery from satellites, we're seeing that the forests are changing across the year. Um, and we can see that they are these sort of living things that are helping us to live our lives mm. as well. And similarly, as you say, with that ice cover too. Um, so that's a really, really cool one. Now, um, I hope that you've been um, making good progress with Aeolus and with Sentinel-6. If you have, do use the hashtag POP23 to share some of the pictures of some of the ones that you've made. Um, and uh, we will um, look at every single one of them. And um, mm. so we'll be looking at the hashtag POP23 um, avidly. Um, but we do have one more more satellite that you might be itching to get started on and that one is called biomass so we'll get a picture of biomass up behind us now it's a bit of a funny looker isn't it Ali and um, it looks like yeah. a sort of umbrella <laughs> out in space there's no two ways to cut it it looks a bit unusual um, but this one is not actually out in space yet it's launching next year in 2024 and it's really really cool because it's actually going to be measuring biomass so that's something that was mentioned in that video about the different types of forest as well and um, it's got some technology that's going to help it not only see through the cloud cover but to see through the um, canopies so the tops of the forests and see through those leaves at the top and it's going to be able to get an idea of how big the trees are, how thick the trees are and actually get an understanding of biomass which is basically just how much stuff 
these trees are made out of, right, Ali? Do you know yeah. anything about any of the equipment that it's going to be using? Uh, well, so that, that, that big dish that you see in there, it's really huge. It's about 12 meters across. I mean, satellites can be any size. You can get one that's small enough to fit in the palm of your hand, but mm -hmm. about the size of a tennis court is pretty uh, regular for these kind of missions. And that dish was so big, it actually had to be designed to be folded out, which is why it's this really weird looking umbrella shape. It's mm -hmm. kind of similar to the Webb telescope, although that was yeah. made of harder pieces that then unfolded. This is a bit more like a real umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's using a similar type of process that Sentinel-6 is using. Slightly different wavelength of light, so this is more into the radio waves now, but mm -hmm. it's the one that allows you to get through that top layer of trees it's so that you can see down to the forest floor. And then, yeah, it's really exciting. I hope they can get it to work too. Yeah, because a lot of satellites, when they do Earth observation, they're taking photos of the surface, but is cloud cover a bit of a problem? Yeah, I don't think clouds are going to be a problem for biomass. No, though. I, I think, think this so. type of uh, wavelength of radio energy yeah. just goes straight through the clouds so you don't notice them at all. Yeah, so it's which very is handy. Yeah, incredible that we've got these space scientists who are coming up with this novel technology that's going to help us study planet Earth more easily. Now, um, Ali, do you have a papercraft biomass that we can have a little look at? Wonderful, beautiful. So it basically looks exactly the same. Maybe the solar panel is on the other Upside side. Upside down? That's yeah. okay. Details, it's details. We're still it's okay. <laughs> we can't all make a perfect satellite first time. Um, but this is biomass. Now, biomass is um, one that we saved to last, not least because it's the only one that hasn't launched yet, but also because it's possibly the trickiest one to make. Yeah. So, Ali, would you be able to pass me over our biomass bus? No, you want to. Now, so it's all in one piece, um, but you might notice that the bit that the um, antella, this sort of umbrella, attaches to is at a point, so it can be a little bit trickier to fold up. So we've got this little L-shaped bit, which is this bit just here, um, which is a little bit uh, more straightforward to fold over, um, but you need to make sure that this bit is lined up on top. So it's mostly an L-shaped um, satellite, I don't know if that's what the satellite scientists who built it would describe it as, <laughs> as an L-shaped satellite. Um, but you're trying to make an L-shape um, out of your satellite and you've got a point at the end here as well. So we've got the, um, the real thing here. A lot of it is sort of straight edges and right angles, but then at the end of the long section here, that's where you've got your point. Um, and if I lean back, oh, you can... Because of the angle of this biomass, you can't quite see the point um, as easily, but it's around about here. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so you want to have a little point at the end, and um, because biomass just decided to be the funniest shaped satellite there could be, it cool. makes it a little bit trickier to build. So this is your challenge. See if you can build biomass. Maybe not by the end of the session, because we've only got about 10 minutes left, um, but you can have a good go. So I will give that back I'm over strong. to you, Ali. Now, there's a couple of other things that I wanted to chat about as well as you get started building your own biomasses. Um, and one of them was uh, to shout out some of the other resources that we have up on the STEM Clubs Our website. And in particular, there is uh, one called Climate Detectives, which was made by the European Space Agency. So they um, have lots of different activities which go into depth about how um, you can use the field of astronomy and space science and Earth observation to understand more about the climate. So Ali said that we're painting a picture over years and years and years, over decades and decades. So satellites went up into space first in the 1950s, yeah. right? Yes, yeah. so we had Sputnik. Got first, which only yeah. lasted a couple of weeks. Had a right? battery and went beep, that was all it could do. Yep, yeah. so we've come a long way since um, the 50s, yeah. about 70 years of satellites. So um, we've come a long way using space science, developing space science to help us in different ways. And the climate detectives um, activities all have different ways that you can explore how you might want to protect the planet, different ways different scientists are protecting the planet, I'm using a little bit of space data. So for example, there's one called Astro Farmer, where you can try growing some plants in different conditions, because that's something they do on the International mm -hmm. Space Station. They actually try and see how plants grow in weightlessness and survive the effects um, in outer space. Um, there is one where you can examine why we see all the different seasons across a year. And as Roseanne said, summer is a different time in the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. So that adds a little bit of complexity to why we see different seasons and different environmental changes changes across different places around the world, but satellites can help us understand that in more depth. And um, we've also got one which is called, I think it's called Under the Lid. 
This is one where you can explore um, the greenhouse effect, um, which is un really why we're seeing climate change happening, because we're getting an enhanced greenhouse effect. Now, um, they actually did it at POP22 last year, so if you want to see what it looks like, you can look at POP22 videos, and Dallas and Susie, who you might have seen earlier on, they had a go at doing that experiment. So you can have a look at that, and you can also look at some of the other activities to see um, which ones you might want to do at home. But I've got a very simple uh, activity that you might want to try as well. If you've got any blankets lying around, or maybe some jumpers, or maybe some jackets, so something that you can cover someone in, because you're going to need a volunteer. I've got a willing volunteer here. I have got um, Ali. Um, he is um, going to be Planet Earth for me, which is a big responsibility. Do you think you're up for it, Ali? Yes, I'm not round enough, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, so you'll need a volunteer to be Planet Earth. And our Planet Earth needs an atmosphere. So Ooh, we've lovely. got a lovely starry blanket because I know you're an astronomer, Ali. So I'm going to wrap this, this around you. Um, there we go. Um, so this blanket is our atmosphere. Now we'll try and make sure that the mic doesn't get too muffled by our atmosphere. I'll look so after it. hear everything the planet Earth <laughs> has to say. So our atmosphere keeps us warm. It keeps us cozy. It also keeps lots of oxygen on planet Earth so mm. life can survive. Do you feel nice and cozy? This is nice. I'm actually a bit chilly to begin with. So, yeah, yeah, so you feel like you could survive yeah, quite, is, easily. Yeah, quite easily. Lovely. So we've got our atmosphere, and that's what Earth uh, needs to have a greenhouse effect. So the greenhouse effect is just a way of saying that heat from the sun comes to planet Earth, some stays on planet Earth because it's kept on around planet Earth by the atmosphere, and some bounces back into outer space, which is good because if it all stayed on planet Earth, we'd get way too hot. That's what Venus is like. It's got a really, really um, thick atmosphere that's yeah. really good at holding on to heat. We don't want that. That's a runaway greenhouse effect. But the thing is that we're seeing climate change because we're producing greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gases are really good at holding on to heat. So greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or methane being the two big ones, um, the more of that we get in our atmosphere, the better they get at holding on to heat. And so more heat from the sun is staying on planet Earth. So we can add some greenhouse gases here uh -oh. because we have lots of cows burping, producing methane. So we can add a Good little curse. bit more heat to our atmosphere. We've got lots of carbon dioxide um, coming from lots of transport. So um, lots and lots of cars, for example, that may be yeah. not very efficient. Um, <coughs> whoops, knocking over some satellites over there. Don't worry. Um, and we've got lots of greenhouse gases coming from, ooh, what's another one? Factories. Have you been burning lots of coal, Lally? I have been trying not to. <laughs> so uh, good. None in my stocking. Some other people have been. So. You can throw on as many different layers of blankets, of jumpers, of jackets onto your Willing Planet Earth volunteer um, and see how many they can survive, how many greenhouse gases they can handle being added to their atmosphere before they feel too warm. How are you feeling, Ali? I thought I was doing all right. I'm starting to get just a <laughs> little bit to toasty in here, a little bit so you got, sweaty. You were warm <laughs> and then you immediately got too hot when I threw too many um, gases on you. But it's all right, I can take it for a bit. Don't worry, you can remove, you can remove your greenhouse oh, thank gases. You. <laughs> We can't necessarily do that I wish as it was easily that simple. on planet Earth. Um, but that is essentially the enhanced greenhouse effect. It's a way that you can try and understand if we're adding more and more of these gases with more and more of these blankets warming us up, then that's why we're seeing this temperature change creeping up around the world. Okay, now that is bringing us near the end of our session today. Now, um, I'm hoping that we've got lots of biomasses on the way to being created um, uh, successfully. Um, and I wanted to do a couple of little shout outs um, to some of the providers throughout the day. So to STEM Learning for putting this amazing day on, for protecting our planet and inspiring people by getting lots of voices of lots of scientists in to protect our oceans, our ice, our forests, and our earth. Um, we also have lots of amazing um, space scientists who've been discussing lots of the work that they've been doing um, and um, so we've heard from some scientists who are talking about some satellite research that they're doing to help us and um, protect our world from space. Now, there's one satellite that I've only made a very, very brief mention of until now. And I thought it might be nice to finish up our session by looking at this satellite. So 
Do you have any idea which one I might be referring to? Um, I think it's the one I forgot to mention as well, the, the biggest <laughs> I one. I wasn't expecting you, don't you worry. Um, it's one that a lot of you may have heard of. Um, it's sort of an international collaboration between scientists from all over the world. It's got international in its name. Yes, so that confirmed we are thinking of the Space same one. Yes. Station. B-I-S-S, absolutely. Now, um, this is a satellite that is going around Earth sort of once every 90 minutes. So which yeah. orbit is it in? Uh, it's in a low Earth orbit, so yeah, going really fast. That's seven and a half kilometers per second Speedy. and I think there's 10 human beings on board it right now. Amazing. Yeah, because yeah, you've always got a few astronauts up there for a few months at a time. Yeah, yeah so true? usually six months, I think. Six days. months. It's about as long as is safe, I think. Yes. So, and yeah. one of the things that a lot of um, scientists on the um, space station um, report is that when they see planet Earth, they report something called the overview yeah. effect. So I don't know if you've ever felt this working in our planetarium. Uh, the planetarium is amazing and it gets so close, but it's not quite, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting at the moon and I can cover the earth with my thumb. <laughs> I think the Apollo astronauts had the strongest one. But mm. if you're if you're seeing the blue marble from space, that's something you can't you just can't see it any other way. So, no. yeah. so um, in a moment, we'll be showing you a video of planet Earth taken from the ISS and you can uh, see why they report feeling the overview effect, which is that feeling that our planet is fragile, that it's worth protecting, um, and that we need to do everything we can to protect it because it's the only planet we have. Um, so the greenhouse effect is great because it means that we can survive on planet Earth. The enhanced greenhouse effect, um, creating the effects of climate change, not so good. So we need to protect our planet, we need to protect all of those different ecosystems and biomes and areas that we've got, um, and we can use lots of different areas of science to do that. So look out for all the stuff on YouTube coming up soon. Thanks again to STEM Learning and to all of our partners for doing this and all of our scientists for contributing over the course of the day. I hope you've had fun and we will leave you with a clip from the ISS of our beautiful planet Earth. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you Bye -bye. all. Thank you.